Hello, and thanks ever so much for inviting me, and particularly to talk about uh, this fascinating and challenging topic. Uh, my name is Chantal Canella. I'm senior lecturer at uh, Newcastle University. Uh, my, my focus of my work is on Afropolitic and Mesolithic Britain, and I, what I've been doing over the past few years is to really get a chronological approach to the Mesolithic. Previously, we've just uh, divided it into early and late, when actually there's a lot more going on. So I've been trying to use radiocarbon dates to sort of get more of an understanding of the history of the Mesolithic as a historical process. So some of the things I'm going to be talking about in this talk uh, really relate to this uh, recent project. So why are there so few human remains uh, in Scotland? Well, to start off with, um, there are a couple of sort of broader answers. Um, one of those is obviously issues of preservation. Uh, the Mesolithic is a long time ago. Uh, organic remains generally do not survive on our archaeological sites. Um, there's also, when we, for sites where we do have organic preservation, uh, there's the, in, the issue of archaeological visibility. And here we have uh, visibility related to sort of Mesolithic mortuary practices themselves. And we can look at the broader record of mortuary practices in Britain to understand how this works in a bit more. Um, but also geomorphological uh, issues, like can we actually find the Mesolithic sites where there are humans? So if we're lucky enough to be in southern Scandinavia, um, we have these very elaborate, rich burials with grave goods. These with the grave goods of uh, flint blades, micros, bone points, uh, beads, give really archaeologists quite a large clue from the off that they're dealing with Mesolithic remains. But we don't get this so much in uh, Mesolithic Britain. Uh, we get very, actually get very few uh, uh, formal burials in the Mesolithic, which I'll go into later. Um, and the ones we do have don't seem to have grave goods. So a burial without grave goods is quite difficult to understand where it comes from, unless you undertake ra radiocarbon carbon dating. We also may be dealing with practices, uh, mortuary practices that don't actually uh, leave any trace at all. And I think um, work I've done with colleagues at Star Car is maybe a case in, in this. We've done really big excavations at Star Car. Um, there's good organic mains in the wetland areas, variable in dryland areas, but we have a, and this is probably the largest open area excavation in Britain, but we don't have any Mesolithic human remains. Whatever they did to the people who lived and died at Starcar is not showing up in the archaeological record. Um, if we look at human remains from Britain, most of these consist of isolated human bones from caves. Um, this is something people throughout history like to do, put dead bodies or parts of dead bodies in caves. Caves have complex uh, uh, sedimentary histories. They're quite often disturbed by animal burrowing. They don't often have a good stratigraphy where we can relate the human remains to associated archaeology. The trying to get understand whether these are Mesolithic just really needs radiocarbon dating, and it's really uh, it's really obvious that where we do have record for human remains, this depends on programs of radiocarbon dating that have happened um, in southwest England and South Wales over the past few decades, and particularly uh, more recent work by um, Shultings and Rich Richards have, um, have given us sort of quite a broad understanding of uh, these practices. Um, more recently, we're getting hints uh, that there are different types of practices involving uh, human remains. Again, these rely on radiocarbon dating. So we now have isolated cremations, isolated human bones from rivers, and a couple uh, occasional burials without grave goods. So really, the foundation for getting uh, finding out about Mesolithic human remains is big programs, uh, and given so many remains in caves, 
the likelihood of getting uh, picking up like quite a lot uh, a lot of later prehistoric uh, and Roman material as well. So um, we've also got geomorphological issues to think about. Um, some landscapes have changed a lot since the Mesolithic. Uh, so some Mesolithic landscapes are now very deeply buried uh, under alluvial deposits, colluvium, or sediments of marine transgression. Um, and we can really, this really sort of comes home with um, uh, Tilbury Man, who has been recently dated by Rick Schulting, who was found uh, 10 and a half metres below the ground surface. This is an old find, uh, 19th century find um, found during the building of, of Tilbury Docks. Um, we also need to think of sort of uh, destruction of, uh, of sites as, as well. So in areas of Scotland, many of the many sites are likely to be destroyed uh, by marine transgressions. And if we think of the uh, human remains we, we do have uh, in Scotland from the Orange Middens, these are middens of strand line that postdate uh, the transgression. Similar types of practice are likely uh, to have been um, uh, destroyed. So what I'd like to do in the rest of this talk is really go through what evidence we do have for treatment of the dead in Britain. And particularly, to, I'd like to take a chronological approach to this, building on my sort of recent research interests. And I think uh, the aim is to really use this as a clue of where uh, you might look for human remains in Scotland and what you might expect to find at particular periods of the Mesolithic. Uh, with uh, the earliest part of the Mesolithic. Um, I've divided the Mesolithic up in, in, into sort of uh, chronological chunks. So this is broadly the first millennium uh, and, and a bit of the Mesolithic. Um, so from just before 9000 to 8000 uh, BC, um, broadly the early, uh, the early Mesolithic. So as you can see from this map, um, we have a lot of known human remains uh, from this period. We have eight sites where these have been found. Um, we also get a really wide variety of practices compared to uh, many later periods. Um, so this includes really big uh, accumulations of human remains, such as Avaline's Hull, where there at least 50 individuals uh, were found. Worm's Head as well, um, and Grey Lake are sites where multiple ind individuals have been recovered. Um, we also get uh, isolated um, burials, such as uh, Goff's Cave, Cheddar Man, and also um, the deposition of isolated human uh, elements. Um, so uh, here we get badger uh, cave sites such as a Badger Hole and Kent Kent's Bank Cavern, and uh, also an isolated uh, humerus um, from Thatcham. You can see uh, from the dots that most of these are caves. Um, caves obviously preserve bone well, so this is partly um, uh, part related to preservation issues, but you also do have other sites as well. Uh, so Thatcham, which seems to be um, Context isn't isn't great, but it's associated with tufa, um, so it may be a watery deposition or eroded from a settlement area. Um, and we also have a recent open air site uh, uh, <coughs> at Grey Lake uh, in Somerset. Um, interestingly, looking at the caves, um, a lot of them seem to be west facing caves. Uh, which might, if we're sort of thinking about broader belief systems, relate to sort of uh, an orientation towards the setting sun, perhaps symbolizing death, but perhaps also suggesting ideas of sort of resurrection or reincarnation of human souls. Um, there's a mainly southwest distribution, um, but you can see one site, Kent's Bank Cavern uh, in, in, in Cumbria. Um, which is one of these sort of human remains, I said human remains found in from antiquarian excavations that have recently been redated. So I think the fact we've suddenly got this one shows um, interesting potential 
uh, for finding the early Mesolithic uh, mortuary treatment in Scotland. So let's just look a bit at these sites. Um, probably the best known of these is, um, and certainly the most extensive, is Aveline's Hole uh, in Somerset. Um, unfortunately, as with most of these sites, this was an early, um, early find. It was found in 1797. Uh, by some men hunting hunting a rabbit. Um, we don't really very know very much about the context of the human remains. Early accounts suggest either either the remains were lying promiscuously or laid out parallel uh, with their heads against um, the, um, uh, the the left the left hand wall. Um, but certainly. There are a lot of human remains. A count before the war in the University of Bristol's Biological Society Museum suggested at least 50 individuals were present. And given that these have been excavated by antiquarians, and there are some quite interesting antiquarian accounts of tourism to this cave where the, 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 the guide would chip off a bit of human remain um, in the early 19th century for someone to take home, there's likely to be a lot more uh, individuals originally found here. Um, Rick Shilting did some really interesting work um, with Mike Westocki on this uh, site in the um, about 2000 in the early 2000s. He did a lot of dating, which suggested uh, that these remains accumulated really over quite a short period, and that men, women, and children are all represented. All these dates came up as Mesolithic, but recently, in the context of DNA work it looks like quite a few of them are potentially uh, Neolithic. And there's also be, always been a few hints that there may be Upper Pelithic uh, evidence here. Unfortunately, most of the remains were destroyed in bombing of the University of Bristol's Theological Society. Um, so we're dealing with quite a small sample of, of what remains. Um, there were some quite good excavations, despite the site suffering so much, there were quite good excavations in the 1920s. Um, by Davis, um, and he um, collected a lot more material from the surface of the cave embedded in uh, a salamite layer, um, but also found a double burial associated with animal teeth and ammonites. It's not beyond the realms of possibility that this is Upper Paleolithic. Um, we, 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 we don't really know, given the current evidence. Um, but this would really be the only evidence of a uh, human, human burial with grave goods. Perforated perinacle shells were found across the cave. Um, probably these were associated with the dead on the surface of the cave, but we just don't have that uh, contextual evidence. Um, there's very little associated lithic debris, um, so it seems the lion's hole was sort of set apart um, from daily life, which is, an, it, which is a sort of continuing theme for Mesolithic uh, cave mortuary practices. A recent, uh, relatively recent finding by uh, 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 Graham Mullen, potential cave art at the back of the cave. Um, all the human remains in the first chamber. This is in the back chamber where Boyd Dawkins dug, but no human remains were found. So a potential different use, perhaps for ritual practices in uh, the back of the cave. Um, just more... Um, uh, variability we see in this early Mesolithic period. So as well as this sort of uh, potentially disarticulated, potentially laid out on the cave floor, potentially buried material at Avalines, we have um, the remains of an intact individual uh, at Goff's Cave, Cheddar Man. Now, Goff's Cave is a very interesting cave. Um, you may have uh, seen um, all this recent uh, evidence, um, which has had a lot of new work. Um, on the Upper Paleolithic human remains from the cave, which has a lot scattered, disarticulated material, um, heavily funerary processing of few of um, particularly focused on the skull. Um, so interesting work by Sylvia Bello done on this recently. So this is the context into which this um, Mesolithic individual is found. Um, so it's within a cave that's got extensive Upper Paleolithic evidence. So by putting this individual within this cave, they may be sort of referring to sort of a mythical past. Um, it may have been based on the noting of other human remains 
uh, extinct animals, for example, it may have seemed quite an interesting, um, potentially powerful place. Um, Cheddar Man is again another early find. He's found in 1903. Um, Goss Cave is a, a rather nice show cave, and it was found by workmen enlarging the show cave. Interestingly, um, Roger Jacobi has a, had accounts um, from the workmen that they found quite a lot of uh, uh, remains from uh, human remains from the cave when they were digging this, but they just kept the most intact one. So there may have been more individuals, uh, Mesolithic individuals, but alternatively, that these may have been more Upper Paleolithic stuff. You can see on your right two um, uh, reconstructions of uh, Cheddar Man, uh, one done in, in the 90s, uh, where he's definitely sporting some uh, uh, lockdown hairstyle, um, and a more recent uh, work um, done on the basis of uh, DNA analysis of, 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 of Cheddar Man, um, showing uh, that contrary to perceptions, um, light skin is something that's relatively recent uh, trait in, in, in Europe. Previously, it's thought that um, pigmentation changed in response to the last glacial maximum. We now know that's not the case. Um, Cheddar Man has a lot of focus, really, is really the only intact sort of nameable individual amongst the Mesolithic sort of burial record. But there's actually been very little um, about him on, 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 on who he was and the broader context of putting him in this, in this cave. Um, yeah, but his life history is he's, uh, he's got a lesion um, on his skull that we can see um, slightly more evidenced in the earlier uh, reconstruction. Um, but it is unusual that this individual was potentially set apart from everyone else and given this intact burial. There may be something about him that means he was treated in this, this, this special way. Uh, newish uh, exciting find. Um, this is new and not new. It was, um, a, a, it's actually a very old excavation. Um, human remains found um, by quarrying in the early years of the 20th century. Um, but a site when it's not been known there's been Mesolith occupation, it's discussed by Clark in his book in the 1930s. But recent redating um, just a few years ago has confirmed that human remains recovered from this site, Grey Lake in Somerset, are do belong to the early Mesolithic. So this is a really rare example of an open air site. And again, it seems to be in a cemetery. Um, at least five individuals were recovered here. What survives? Uh, the skulls are all seem to be of adult males. And one, again, seems to have survived a blow to the head. Um, Grey Lake uh, is, a one, uh, is a sort of little sandy island, uh, a birtle bed. In, um, in the Somerset levels, uh, an area that's now very marshy and waterlogged, but that, that's due to sort of rising sea level. So this would have been a little sandy island within a river's, river's floodplain. Um, another thing that really sets us apart is the lithic assemblage looks like it's contemporary with the human remains. So we have a rare instance here of the dead buried amongst the sort of debris of everyday life. So there seems a real contrast to the caves where the dead seem to be set apart, um, put into these unusual, uh, unusual contexts. Um, it may suggest, and these, these, are, these, these sites are, are pretty close. So again, we see different practices going on broadly at the same time, but treating the dead very differently. The middle Mesolithic, um, uh, this is a period that I've, I'm defining here as between 8,000 and 7,000 BC. I do think there is some, this can broadly be distinguished in terms of the lithic evidence, um, in terms of microlithalization in the north and in the terms of, in the presence of uh, basically modified points in the south. So it, it does seem to have a sort of real cultural element to it. Um, you can see a bit of a change. It's a continuity and change with the early Mesolithic. Um, here we have uh, a sort of quite restricted range of context. These are all caves. And in contrast to the sort of really big accumulation in caves of the early Mesolithic, these are all individual isolated elements. 
um, being put into caves. And we particularly see an interest in the use of shafts into caves and swallet holes. Here at Tottypot in Somerset, um, this is actually on the plateau above Goff's Cave, but you'll see that Totty, um, one of the main entrances of Totty Pot is a shaft into the earth. And if we imagine sort of uh, dropping human bone into shafts, uh, this would maybe be seen as sort of, we see these as numerous accounts of shafts being seen as entrances to the underworld. So there may be this idea that deposition of human remains um, was take, taking them to the underworld. <coughs> You also see this on Coldy uh, Island, uh, where we get an a interesting cluster of uh, Mesolithic remains dating to this period. So on the left, we see um, the site of uh, Ogoverikin, uh, the Cave of the Oxen. Uh, most of the human remains seem to have been dropped uh, through this chimney uh, on the left-hand side, um, being found between Chamber 1 and uh, ch Chamber 3. Um, Coldy is now an island, um, but the sea then would have been encroaching. It would have been quite an interesting sort of dramatic rock formation over sort of a coastal plain. Um, so quite a similar topographic position to Worm's Head that was used for human remains in the early Mesolithic. We see quite an interesting shift in that the caves are all facing inland and to the north, which is a contrast to the sort of western facing nature of the early Mesolithic caves. And this could potentially uh, see a shift in the understanding of death from sort of metaphors of setting sun and uh, reincarnation to death perhaps being associated with the north and being a bit more, bit more final, potentially a speculation. The late Mesolithic, um, the period uh, I'm dividing here between 7,000 and 5,000 BC, we can see a bit of a change uh, going on. Um, there's quite a few sites, but this period is basically um, uh, 2,000 years compared to uh, the other periods we've looked at. So there's um, a slight a reduction, actually, in number of sites. Um, K, there's no evidence for the use of the caves in southwest England. Um, and these have been such a focus for deposition of human remains over the past few millennia. So there seems to be a bit of a shift going on. Instead, we get lingering um, deposition in, in Coldy Island um, and a real focus of deposition in a little small valley um, at Paviland, two, two caves at Paviland, uh, the famous site, um, Goat Hole at Paviland that's got Gret in human remains, and also a smaller cave, uh, Fox Hole at Paviland. We see expansion into North Wales at Pont Nowith. Again, this similar theme, isolated human element. Again, we begin to see a bit of variety and three interesting sites that have either been uh, excavated recently or been dated recently, all from uh, Eastern England, um, which show a, a variety of different practices going on. Um, it's also interesting that we see a gap of a thousand years from the last, uh, the latest of these sites on this map, uh, which is uh, Paviland, to the date for the Orense Middens. So we have a big gap that's principally noted by a number of authors, which still seems to remain. Detail at the finds from Eastern England, because I think these have quite a lot of interesting potential for, 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 for areas we perhaps should be looking at more broadly for human remains. So these sites are Staythorpe in Nottingshire and Langford and Tilbury in Essex. Um, Staythorpe is an isolated uh, femur from the Paleo Channel of the Trent. Uh, it was found in uh, uh, through commercial archaeology, as was as with Langford. I think this is an interesting new development. Um, it's difficult to know whether this is a deposition of an isolated element in water, as has been suggested by Richard Chatterton, or whether it's a burial or something else that's been eroded from the bank. There do seem to be sort of other remains, uh, animals and lithic, so it may be something that's been eroded. Um, from a riverside uh, settlement site. Um, just in the past few years, Tilbury Man, who, who I mentioned earlier, who's found in the 1880s, um, has uh, been dated to the late Mesolithic. Um, unfortunately, because this was fact, context of find, we don't know very much about this, even 
even whether really it was a burial. But the fact most of this individual there, including small bits, does suggest it is likely to be a uh, riverside burial. Uh, this is an older man. Again, he's got two heel lesions. And these, these lesions, which we see in a number of individuals, are quite interesting. It's something we see in the southern Scandinavian uh, burial record as well. We don't know if maybe some of these individuals are sort of marked out for special burial because they're, they're seen as special because of either surviving or being killed by such injury. Um, there's been suggestions that this sort of presence of lesion may re relate to some sort of um, uh, ritualized violence potentially, but it could also be um, potentially have a, a dubious medicinal practice. Um, and we know that sort of head injuries um, potentially do relate, uh, do lead to uh, things like fitting, which can be seen as evidence of sort of possession by spirits in some societies. So these potentially could be in individuals which might be seen as in some ways special. Uh, we've also got land, uh, the first cremation in a British context, so they're known from the continent and, and from Ireland as well. Again, a commercial excavation. Um, and a little, this was found in a little uh, pit uh, with a couple of piece, pieces of flint associated. But we only, because cremations haven't been seen as part of the Mesolithic record, it's only thanks to the fact this was dated, which it very easily might not have been, that we know this is Mesolithic. Um, an analysis of the human remains uh, shows, um, this is actually a relatively small element of human remains here. Um, we only know it's the remains of an older child or an adult. That's all we can tell. Um, it seems to be uh, part of uh, the pit seems to be filled with a part, uh, sample of pyre debris. We don't know what happened to the rest of, of the remains. But this fits a sort of broader pattern we see um, within the Mesolithic of the use of pits for the deposition of burnt material. Um, Things have been transformed by fire, hearth sweepings that we see uh, in, in um, various sites that Carolyn Wick and Jones has excavated. Um, she's, because she's done such nice radiocarbon dating, uh, we can really see this is a, a mesolithic practice. It's also been noted uh, recently by, in a big survey of pits by Ed Blinkhorn. So this may be part, this seems to be part of a broader practice in the mesolithic of putting the sort of transformed half material rating to sort of food, but also the transformation of human remains and death uh, into pits. So just very briefly, I'd like to move on to what we see at the very end of the Mesolithic, the final Mesolithic, the last thousand years, and we see a real different pattern. Uh, nothing in England and Wales, which have been really the focus for Mesolithic remains throughout this talk. And instead we see our nice dot uh uh three sites uh on the small island of uh Orense. um so there's been quite a lot of work on the remains uh from the, the Orense middens uh, the the suggestion that it's really dominated by uh human uh, sort of fingers and toe bones which has been suggested by a number of authors might be related to sort of practices of excarnation and that the larger bones would be sort of taken up and disposed of elsewhere, whereas these are th the little finger and toe bones were just sort of overlooked. However, more recent work has perhaps suggested there's maybe a bit more going on. Um, so some nice uh, spatial analysis, um, which was originally taken, undertaken by Richard Nolan in the 1980s, um, but me more recently revisited um, by Chris, Chris Meikle, John, and also Ellen McKillis, Kinnis as well. And also the really nice Bayesian model allows you to, for Oren saying that now is allowed you to pick, pick apart um, the middens a bit more. Um, so we have more e evidence here from Knock Coig, more extensively excavated, slightly better dated. Um, and here we see these, some of these clusters associated with quite interesting contexts. So two of them are associated with um, the structures that have been found at the site. Um, so they're associated with the first structure, um, a cluster, a little cluster, and there's also a refit between this and the midden behind it. And there's another um, cluster associated with the early levels of the phase two structure. 
So it may be that these some of these remains were sort of curated, kept in domestic contexts. Um, and Nolan's work um, also um, discovered that another of these small clusters uh, was found resting in a seal flipper. And I think you can see here the real similarity between uh, the human uh, phalanges and the seal flippers. So it seems here that perhaps people are making comparison between human bodies and animal bodies. And if we think of sort of the role of uh, seals in mythology, sort of selkies, for example, the sort of they they have been seen as sort of having human-like qualities, age, their own agencies, for example. So it may be that with these pe people are sort of pointing out similarities uh, between humans and seals, um, part of their broader understanding of, of the world. A sort of quick tour, I think, through the real changing chronological patterns we see in uh, uh, mortuary practices across Mes Mesolithic Britain. And I think we can use um, some of the patterns we see in this material to th think about uh, how we might locate more human remains in Scotland. And what's been key to discovering remains in uh, England and Wales has been radiocarbon dating. Um, so that would be really the foundation, obviously an expensive thing. Um, that's really the foundation for find, discovering uh, more human remains and particularly focusing on, uh, on these sort of key landscape foci that are important in, in mesolithic mortuary practices. So particularly caves um, and really dating isolated human remains from old excavations. There's been a reasonable amount of work sort of looking at uh, human remains from caves. But I wonder if a lot of memorials is focused on um, middens because they're seen as a, mes uh, as a mesolithic uh, thing, whereas dating stuff in other contexts might, um, uh, might produce some interesting results. Though, as I said earlier, all people throughout prehistory love putting human remains in caves. So it's uh, certainly, uh, certainly it needs a there will be a lot of later prehistoric material coming through such a project as well. Middens also, uh, certainly for Scotland, are, seem to be a key, uh, a, a key context. Um, and, and maybe uh, thinking about the potential of the East Coast middens, so that I know there's sort of renewed excavations in areas, but also really these old uh, midden sites that were discovered in the 19th century. Um, some of these have Neolithic dates, some have Mesolithic dates, but this again might be a potential area for thinking for finding uh, new remains. Um, some of the exciting new work in Britain um, comes from developer funded work, um, which has picked up more stuff in river valleys and also cremations. Um, river valleys are often deeply buried, so the they're quite, can be quite the archaeology can be quite difficult uh, to access. But certainly we see hints that these are important contexts. And, and cremations too. Uh, we know from Langford now that these are something that happened in the Mesolithic. There are lots of undated cremations on archaeological sites. So this might again might be a, a way forward for uh, broadening our understanding of mortuary practices in, in the Scottish Mesolithic uh, record. Um, and finally, thank you very much for listening and good luck with the hunt for new human remains. And I'd just like to say uh, the dating project, a lot of this is based on with very kindly funded uh, by the British Academy. So thanks very much. <laughs>